NFTs have transcended the, the blockchain industry. Major, major brands from Web2 are moving in. None bigger than the one we have coming up next. We have a dynamic duo. First, we have the CEO of Capital Block, a leading NFT agency specializing in sports clubs and teams. Joining him is the head of McLaren Racing, it's a Web3 program, Max Wolf and Timothy McNall. So, hi, I'm Tim McNall. I'm the CEO of Capital Block, which is a Web3 strategic and creative agency. Uh, we represent clients like Max uh, from McLaren. Um, we also represent Cristiano Ronaldo, Binance, Tezos, to, to name a few. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Max Wolf. I'm the uh, senior manager for Web3 and digital licensing at McLaren Racing. Um, it's corporate lingo, basically what it means is I lead the Web3 project, uh, anything blockchain related that McLaren Racing does, and then the digital licensing side of things covers more like metaverse, virtual spaces, uh, you know, avatar projects, all that fun stuff. Um, and then also sitting with my team is the Web3 community management, so mostly taking the form of Discord server. So Max, I want to kick this talk off because we've spoken about it a lot, but are we really still talking about NFTs? Because since the last conference that I was at, we've had the metaverse, which was kind of kicking off, which Sam has just alluded to in his speech earlier. And then we've now got AI. So most Web3 experts who were probably in this room last year are now AI experts as well. So is NFTs really still part of the digital landscape for McLaren? Are you really investing time into it? Yeah, um, I mean, we should just scrap the rest of this talk. Let's go off on AI, let's go off on, on uh, you know, something else. Um, no, so the, the truth is, at McLaren, like, we're pretty bought into the long-term future of Web3, and NFTs are certainly a part of that. I think for us, though, like, you know, we don't focus as much on like the developer perspective of NFTs. Like we're not as focused on token standards and you know the specifics of the smart contract. Like for us, it's more about taking the fans' perspective. So for a sports fan, what is the value of an NFT? And it's as a digital collectible, right? So like as we all spend more time in the digital world. Um, we think that it only makes sense that we should start to accumulate an inventory of digital assets, just like how uh, when we travel, you know, we collect uh, fridge magnets or I like to buy like football shirts from the countries that I visit. Like, so it also makes sense that you would accumulate digital things from uh, attending virtual events or, you know, uh, following your favorite team on social media or something like that. And so I guess that's really the point of the 23 of 23 program is to um, allow people to accumulate this digital inventory. And so um, the program that we've done along with Tim and his team and Tezos, um, it's a program celebrating the 23 separate races that we have across the year. And uh, it allows fans to collect 23 unique race posters over the course of each race weekend. Yeah, and when we talk about the 23 of 23, I remember when you guys briefed us and you gave us a very, very specific campaign and a very specific brief. And what you wanted was actually something that people would feel proud of to have at home or have on their wall or have in the office. Because we hear a lot about digital collectibles, but when we look at a lot of the collectibles, do you actually want to collect them, especially from a sports perspective? We've seen some awful, awful NFT drops from yeah. sports clubs where you don't actually want to collect them. So I know when you briefed us, the main thing that you said was create something that people actually want to collect, incorporate art, but then also bring data. So bring a kind of blockchain Web3 element in, which we'll talk a little bit later about, where we embedded data. So to the, to the kind of naked eye, there's little bits of data in each of these pieces of uh, creative that are data from a previous race that McLaren have had that they've given to us and then we've embedded that. Um, so we sp went, uh, worked a, for, with McLaren a lot on the IP and then the data and then we also forget about the IP because we couldn't use race tracks, we couldn't use the drivers, there's certain things so we really needed to create a Formula One campaign 
that was an ode to the city or the race that it was happening in, but then also bringing it back to McLaren. However, after we did all of this, we then got a call from McLaren and from Max, and he then said, look, we want to do a free-to-drop campaign. So they've invested a huge amount of time, a huge amount of resources, but then you called me and you said, we want to do it for free, which goes completely against what essentially the majority of the sports industry have done, which is a cash grab. Let's launch something, let's jump on the hype, let's try and get our fans to buy into something because they think they're going to make a load of money. Whereas you then came to us and said, we want to do it for free. Like, what was the reasoning and why did you invest this time and the resources and then decide you wanted to do it for free? Yeah, so we'll go into that. Um, I promised oh, those two NFTs were static. They are cooler. Uh, you'll just have to come check out our collection uh, to see the, the real things. Um, so yeah, we decided to do a free, a free program. Couple reasons for this. Um, Formula One is a bit unique from other sports. So if you think about football, soccer, basketball, whatever, they have arenas, right? They're owned places that the team can set up as they like and do like all kinds of marketing activations and it's branded. Uh, as Formula One, we race in 23 separate locations around the world. We don't own our own track, no team does. Uh, we have a garage, which is like a couple square meters and it's full of hot metal and mechanics running all around and tires and things and you know, you can fit like five people in there. So it's not a good place for marketing. So um, that's one challenge we had. Um, another is that I think it, not just in Formula One, but in like sports fandom in general, there's a certain degree of like crypto and NFT skepticism. And so uh, the free part of the token was to try and overcome those barriers and like, you know, by making it free, you, you de-risk it for people to uh, involve themselves in. So it overcomes a bit of that skepticism and then, um, you know, it allows people, even though they can't come to the track and be in the garage with us, you know, you can still um, collect something, show your passion, and uh, it generates like a bit of a talking point as well for like fans across the world, the Papaya fan in Brazil and Indonesia and England, all to come together and speak about and, uh, yeah, you know, just like demonstrate their fandom. And I think when you think about NFTs and you think about sports, we hear a lot about buzzwords like sports is going to be mass is going to be the key to mass adoption. But we've seen some of the biggest football clubs in the world create NFTs that has not had mass adoption. And then another thing we hear, which we'll talk about in a minute, is community. But then that seamless experience, like oh, you can buy it with your credit card, you can do this, you can do that. But you guys really created a seamless experience. You created a McLaren dot sorry collectibles dot McLaren homepage dedicated to this, and then he worked with one of your sponsors, Tezos, to actually create that seamless experience. And all you need is an email address and or social media, and then you can claim one of these, and you don't have to have a wallet, you don't have to have anything like that. So how important was working with Tezos and really creating that seamless experience for your average Formula One fan? Yeah, I mean, it, it was critical, and like you can't overstate the importance of that seamless experience. Um, so, if you examine it from a fan's perspective, like first they go to collectibles.mclaren.com. It's not, um, you know, Tezos.xyz. It's it's not something that they wouldn't recognize, and you know, everyone in this audience would probably be comfortable with uh, different URLs and things. But for the average sports fan, like it means a lot if they can already like feel comfortable from the start, from the domain name. And then once you're on the page, um, Tim, as you said, it's as simple as entering an email address. It creates an account. If you are not really familiar with Web3, you wouldn't even realize that a wallet has been created for you. And I think that's the key. Um, I'm sure you've all heard it before. And if you hadn't, you're going to hear it a lot this, um, during this festival. That like. The key to mass adoption is going to be people not even realizing that they're interacting with something underpinned by blockchain. And I think it's, it's funny that we had this Web3 burst, Web3 dived onto the scene, and now we're actually going back to more of a, a Web2 mechanic to then actually nurture fans back into Web3. But did it work? So you've dropped it, you've invested money, you've brought an agency on, but how were the numbers? Did it work? Yeah, uh, did it work? Honestly, it surpassed our expectations. Um, so we are 
we, we launched the program in March with the first race of the 2023 Formula One season. So it's been going for about four months now. And uh, we have almost two million claims from fans. Um, we've created about 400,000 new wallets on the Tezos blockchain from this activation. And we've also uh, managed to add over six figures in uh, people to our McLaren Plus loyalty program. So as far as we know, this is the most successful free sports drop ever. It's amazing. And in terms of who these users are, because when you think about community, you, from an NFT perspective, you don't necessarily think about Formula One fans. You don't actually think about sports fans. NFTs, Web3, within the sports sector needs to be completely rebranded. And that's where we need to go back to the Web2 that we were just talking about, a Web2 process. But in terms of the community that you created, you used one platform and was fairly heavy on that platform, which was, of course, Discord. But when you look at your average sports fan, not many of them are Discord users. So why did you go down this route? And how heavily did this play in the success to get those numbers? So I, I'm personally a huge fan of Discord. And I think it was absolutely critical to the success of this program. Um, I think we started off by laying the foundation in Discord before this program was launched. So when I joined McLaren Racing, the Discord server had been created just to service the Web3 community. And you know, if, if you look at like the Venn diagram of Formula One fans and Web3 fans, that, that's a small intersection to be targeting. So um, we expanded the remit of the Discord server. You know, we have channels for all of our racing series. Um, we're in there during the races, and people can discuss them live. Memes channels, uh, merch channels, fan art, all that. So the McLaren community was already used to being on Discord. And then once we launched this program, um, and you know, the fact that it was free, people didn't feel like they were being sold something or marketed something. They felt like it was just something really cool that we were doing for the community. And like an example of this is, Tim, you mentioned that the NFTs are um, covered with like little interesting pieces of data and facts, so they're Easter eggs that the fans have to try and figure out. And so if you come to our server one minute on a Friday morning after the token launches, it'll be full of messages of people trying to figure out um, you know, the meaning behind the, the little Easter eggs. And we're in there with the fans, interacting with them directly. And you know, as a fan, if you're super keen and you guess what the meaning behind this number is, and you get a response directly from someone at McLaren with like a funny gif saying, oh, like you got it, like nice job. You know, those are the sort of like one-to-one -one interactions that I think are so important. And like as marketers, we're often told to focus on the big things, like go for the Instagram post with you know, 10 million impressions or, or the, the big Twitter post. But like, I really believe in also not forgetting the importance of those one-to-one -one interactions. And in terms of Discord, I guess it's a bit of a clean space for what you can do and how you can speak to the audience. So as you said, you have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to really engage with your fans. And when you look at other sponsorship deals and when you look at what McLaren's trying to do, you've got 50 odd partners or yep. 50 odd sponsors and all of them are trying to vie for car time, racer time, track time, Instagram, all your social media. So in terms of Discord, it's a great way and it's an open space for brands to start utilizing that. And I think that leads us on nicely into, into where this is then going in terms of the future. In terms of the short, medium, long term for McLaren and then sports, where do you see this going? And, and is Web3 going to be here to stay for McLaren, in your opinion? All right, so I can see we've got a minute and a half left. So quick whistle stop. Uh, short, medium, long term. You guys are the first to know. Exclusive announcement for you all. Um, later this month, we're doing a heritage drop around McLaren, um, like historic IP moments that made our team famous. I think you'll start to see a lot of sports teams and also sports IP holders start to bring out their like um, heritage catalogs as a way to engage maybe demographics that they haven't hit yet into their Web3 program, you know, people that have been following the team for longer. In the medium term, um, I really want to focus on like art and virtual spaces. So virtual spaces as a way for token holders to get additional utility, you know, access like different rooms, different experiences, even as places to display their token collection. And then uh, finally, partnerships. So 
Web3, it has to be sustainable from a financial perspective, and part of that is, I think, in involving more brand partners in the space. And Tim, I'll, I'll let you speak a bit to this point. Yeah, I think from a partnership perspective, where we see it, a capital block from a strategic agency is IP holders, it's getting more and more expensive for any rights holders to attract money, get more sponsors, so they have to raise the price, raise the price. So I think where we really see a new area that's going to unfold is using Web3 to create a community and create that foundation, like a free drop that you guys have done, but then take that community to your sponsors and then create content or create opportunities for those sponsors. So if we talk about Richard Mir Watches, one of McLaren's sponsors, if we could then go to them and then say, look, we've got a community of 100,000, 2 million, whatever it may be, and then say, let's create some exclusive content that benefits that community, and then the community are also benefiting from the sponsorship. That's really the ultimate goal for any sponsor, to have that direct communication. And I think Web3 is a platform now that is starting to really gain traction where you can create your own platforms and you can brand them and you can bring on specific Web3 sponsors for big IP holders. So that, that's our vision and, and where we're kind of advising our clients and where we see it going. Yeah, I totally agree. It's uh, looking forward to many more years of sport and Web3 to come. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone.